center upon the theme of redemption with the message entitled, The Covering of Confession. The Covering of Confession. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as we now enter this time where you can speak to us, impart to us, offer us words of instruction and hope, guidance and peace. As we open ourselves to you fully, mind, heart, body, and soul, speak to our hearts this day, for we, your servants, are listening. I now decrease and ask that you would increase so that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given, will give glory to you. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. Uh, back when this particular TV show was on, I was an avid fan, and that show was CSI. Now, I wasn't necessarily a fan of the original. Somehow, I just couldn't connect with it. But CSI Miami and CSI New York, every time they were on, I was right there, glued to the television screen. And like most police dramas, there is this culmination at the end where the suspect is brought into an interrogation room. Now, with CSI in particular, they present the evidence of why they figured out they're the culprit, and they give them this opportunity, this moment of confession in order to explain why they did what they did. It's always wonderful, and certainly on those shows that came with some great culmination and drama as the two titular characters, the police officer on one hand and the culprit on the other hand are glaring at each other with this recognition that you found me out. Good for you. Well, friends, this day we find ourselves in our own interrogation room, a divine interrogation room. The Holy Spirit has come presenting the evidence to us that certainly would justify we being judged and we're offered now the opportunity, that same opportunity that those characters in the TV show are offered, a time to confess, to explain what it is and why it is that we've done it. Now, unlike CSI, what we have waiting for us is not a jail cell. What we have waiting for us is the grace and compassion of a God that forgives. That when we confess our sins, when we confess our wrongdoing, when we admit and own those things that we know has broken God's heart, God is just and always does forgive. Our psalmist writes about this sense of forgiveness and redemption, this sense of restoration and hope as they pen these words to us, recognizing that indeed, blessed are those who confess their sins to God, whose sins have been covered over, the psalmist would say. The psalmist goes forward, happy are those whose forgive, sins or transgressions are forgiven. Happy are those whom the Lord impugns no iniquity and whose spirit has no deceit. The God has covered over those things that they have confessed. Now, when we talk about the covering of confession, we're not talking about a concealing or a hiding or a deception. When we're talking about the covering of confession, think of it like a band-aid. When you get a wound, what does a Band-Aid do? It provides protection for the wound until it's had time to heal. That's what the covering of confession does. When we confess our wrongdoings to God, God covers over the wound, the vulnerable spot, in order for us to be made whole, in order for us to heal, so that our vulnerable state will not be taken and used against us. God offers us that covering when we confess our sins, recognizing that in our vulnerable state, it is easy for us to become distracted, for us to become uh, moving in a direction opposite from where God would have us to go. As people of faith, indeed, we attempt to conceal, to ignore, or rationalize our poor behavior. But when we do so, our deception drains our reservoirs of joy. Listen to what the psalmist says here in verse 3. While I kept silent, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For God, for day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was dried up as with the heat of summer. And although today we don't necessarily understand the heat of summer, it will be here soon enough and we will certainly beg for cooler temperatures. But what the psalmist helps us illustrate, as long as they tried to conceal it, as long as they tried to hide it from God, it started to waste away. For as people of faith, when we know we've done wrong and we don't admit it, it saps our strength. 
it seeps away at the joy that the Lord wants to offer to us until we've come to that moment where we confess. What does the psalmist say in verse 5, the second part? But then I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sins. Selah. Selah is just another word of saying amen, another word of saying thank you, Lord, another word of saying I appreciate what you've done and what the psalmist recognized as long as I tried to keep it from you, as long as I tried to conceal it from you, it wasted away. But the moment I decided to give it to you, Lord, the moment I decided to take ownership of it, that's when I felt the burden lift and peace was restored. Our psalmist reminds us that the confession that we offer to God is the one that helps us to be made whole, the one that helps us to be forgiven, the one that helps us to be restored and renewed. That's why we confess our sins to God. Not that God does not already know what we've done, for God knows it all. But just like a parent who looks to their child to admit their wrongdoing in order to provide them a measure of grace, so too God looks to us to come and to admit what we've done. Friends, I know this would be hard for you to believe, but when I was a, a junior in high school, I was a little bit on a rebellious side. And so I had come to in a sense that I was larger than my mother, taller than my mother, and I thought I was smarter than my mother. I know you cannot relate. I, I'm, I'm helping trying to, I'm painting a portrait for you. And, and as we were walking out of the house one day, my friends and I stopped to ourselves, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to say we're going one place, which we eventually were going to go, but we were going to meet up with some uh, people of the fairer sex, going to have ourselves a get together. And I walked out of the house with a straight face telling my mother in no hesitation, a bold faced lie about what was about to happen. And my mother looked at me with that same look that every parent looks at their child when they know that they're being lied to in their face and says, really? That, that's, that's what we're doing? Yes, that's, that's what we're doing. So I walked out of the house thinking that I convinced my mother that I was doing what I was supposed to do. And as uh, we rode out, we picked up our lady friends. We went to White Castle because that was what we were doing in high school. We had White Castle money. wasn't doing that extreme, <laughs> extreme Melly Weathers or, or those things. No, we went to White Castle money. So we were hanging out and then we went to our football practice. We picked them back up. We hung out a little later and uh, my curfew was 11 o'clock, friends. I didn't get back home until about 2 now, my excuse for that was that we got pulled over by the police officers, and so I thought that was going to be the uh, clincher of, here's why I couldn't be home at 11, although my mother knew that I had lied from the beginning, and when I walked into the house, I told my brother who was with me, go right upstairs, because you can't tell a lie, at least not today. <laughs> so as he's trying to go upstairs, you know what every good parent does? Hold on a second, come here. We need to have a conversation. And in that moment, I was given the opportunity to confess. In that moment, I was given the opportunity to own what I had done. And like most disobedient, rebellious folks, when we have those moments of thinking that we've gotten over on God, I stuck to the lie. That, that's, that's what we did. We went to practice. We came right back. We would have only been home sooner if it had not been for those police officers. You know, those police officers, and I'm going in, those police officers put us over unjustly. Bobby. We were so scared. And she looked at me with that stone face of every parent that says, right now I'm praying for God not to have me put hands on you. <laughs> and then the fracture of the lie comes apart as mom says, I, I know that's not what you did. I, I know what's going on here. I know that you picked up two lady friends because you thought you were slick by dropping them off at the end of the block, but you didn't see me peek my head out to see what was going on. And as the ravel of the lie become unfurled, I, I even thought to myself in that rebellious moment, as we often do, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'll be on punishment maybe a week or two, look sullen faced, and then get some grace and mercy. And as I came down the stairs the next morning on my way to school, I, I asked my mom this rebellious question, what, what's my punishment? Now, those of you who've been in that position recognize that if your parents haven't told you already, that's a sign to say, don't ask them no questions. 
So I went off to school, and it was the beginning of a school year, and you know at the beginning of your school year is when everything's happening, every party, every gathering, everything's happening, and I'm coming back home, and I said, uh, Mom, what's my punishment? Because there's a party in, happening next week, and I just want to know if I'm going to be off punishment or not. The boldness. And what my mother helped me understand was that the unexpected consequences of trying to conceal deceit are heavy. And she laid out the heaviest punishment that I'd ever conceived of. You're not leaving the house for the next three months. Except to go to school, to go directly to practice, and come right back home. No visitors, no guests, no telephone. That was before we had cell phones, y'all, before we had cell phones. No telephone calls. All your life is going to consist of is school, practice, and home for three months. And I thought after two weeks I could do the sullen face and get grace. No. After a whole month, I figured maybe some grace. No. And as I'm telling all of my friends who are like, oh, you missed it. It was the best thing. When are you going to be off punishment? <sighs> what? Huh? I'm going to be on punishment for another two months. Indeed, the covering of confession allows us to take ownership of what we have and for God to be that band-aid and that solve to heal that moment. And what I realized in that moment as I'm enduring that three months of punishment is that I can't really lie to my mama. She knows stuff because God tell her stuff. Now, I can deceive mom, but there's no deceiving God. And from that moment to this moment, whether it was something uncomfortable or not, I was always honest. Or I remained silent and took my Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate myself. But indeed, friends, when we confess, when we own that which we are offering to God, those things that sap away our strength, those things that hinder us from experiencing and becoming all that God wants us to do, there is a freedom, there is a joy, there is a peace. And that's what God wants to offer us this covering of confession to heal those broken, fractured areas of our life that we might be made whole, that we might become transformed, that we might become brand new. Indeed, admitting that we've gone astray in the words of our communion confession that we've sinned by what we've done and what we've left undone offers us an opportunity for ownership of our poor choices, our harsh words, our deceitful interactions, and our manipulative behavior so that God covers us while we are learning to shift our thinking, to improve our communication, and to seek to live with integrity and character. I say it frequently, friends. God is not asking us to be perfect. God is asking us to be consistent to day in and day out, to strive to get better than we were the day before. And in those moments where we slip, in those moments where we've made a bad choice, in those moments where we could not bridle our tongue and we've said something that has wounded someone, not only do we seek God's forgiveness, we seek their forgiveness so that we might continue to grow in our faith. And so friends, as we move forward into this Lenten season, as we continue to edge ever closer to that empty tomb, we are reminded of the great gift that Christ offers us. That all who believe in him, all those who confess their sins, all those who come who are willing and able to make transformation, who are looking to God to do something in their lives, are forgiven and made whole. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.